just to let you know something about me a little personally, um, I don't like going backwards. I know that sounds weird, um, but there's a reason for it. I don't like going backwards uh, because I, I'm the youth pastor here, um, and in our teen room, uh, we've kind of started packing it out, and the teens keep pushing me closer and closer to the wall um, as I'm trying to preach to them. Um, and I get a little animated sometimes, uh, and the issue is that there are these two TV screens that are in the teen room, uh, which are super helpful. We get the words for the songs on the screen, words for the verses, stuff like that, um, but it's not helpful when I'm going backwards because I'm constantly hitting the back of my head on the point right where those two screens meet, and the teens love it. They just laugh at me, and it's a great time until I get knocked out, and then they won't be laughing anymore, uh, or maybe they'll laugh harder. I don't know. Um, I don't like going backwards in that case, um, and so uh, this is why one of the greatest inventions to me, uh, something that I love, is the backup camera in vehicles. Um, it's just incredible to me, uh, and especially because the car that I personally have does not have one. Uh, anytime I get parked and there's two trucks uh, that park directly beside of me, I just pray and I hope that there's no one coming because I can't see. I have no clue. But I'm in my wife's car, and I can see everything, like this fisheye view. I'm like 30 spots down, but I can see the guy walking out of Target picking his nose, and I'm like, this is incredible. Like I can see absolutely everything. Uh, but even even in that case, backing up, even though I can see everything, it only gets you so far when you're driving. Really, your journey doesn't even begin until you put it in drive and you start moving forward. That's when the journey starts, when you start moving forward. Really, in life, I don't necessarily enjoy looking backwards either because our journey doesn't get going until we start moving forward. The issue with that is, just like a backup camera, we can see what we feel like is so clearly everything that's behind us. But when we put it in drive and we decide, I'm going to move forward, the struggle with that for us is that we can't see anything. We don't know the future. We can't see what lies ahead. And that's why we gather here today. Because there is one that calls us from where we are now and calls us to follow him into the future that he wants to lead us to, and that's Jesus. He calls us to follow him forward, and so right now what we're going to do is seek Jesus for what we need in this moment and what we need moving forward. So I'm going to ask you to go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, and we're going to hear directly from the words of Jesus this morning and hear what he has to say. I'll let you know as you're turning there, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, I'll let you know that this is not the message that I would have chosen to preach to you today. Uh, and yet it is a message that God has been preaching to me in a sense day after day after day, and it is something that has absolutely convicted me and something that has given me so much hope. And so I pray and I hope that Jesus and what he says here will be a help to you and all of us this morning. The lesson that Jesus is teaching his disciples and followers in Matthew 6, 24, where we're about to pick up, it actually starts all the way back in chapter 5, and it doesn't end until chapter 7. These are three incredible chapters of Jesus teaching his followers one lesson after another after another about a life of following him and a life of seeking the Father and his will and what it means to live for him. Incredible three chapters, and I wish we could just talk about it all this morning, but we'd never leave. So we're starting in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 because Jesus right here makes a powerful declaration. He starts in verse 24 of Matthew 6 by saying this, No man can serve two masters. And Jesus starts out with a definitive statement. No man. It is impossible. A human being cannot serve two masters. And you're sitting here thinking, I have two jobs. This is super awkward. But it's not. Because Jesus tells us why we cannot serve two masters as we move on in verse 24. He says, no man can serve two masters for 
Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Jesus gives us two reasons why humans are not capable of serving two masters. Option one, you will hate one and love the other, or option two, you will hold to the one and despise the other. It would be easy to just lump these together and say, okay, you like one and you don't like the other, we get it. But that's a lot of words to just say, I like this one, I don't like that one. But that's, that's not it. Because Jesus is making a specific distinction. He says, for either this or else that. There's two options on the table for why serving two masters is not an option for us. He starts with hate and love, and these are words we're quite familiar with. We probably use them on a regular and daily basis, and they describe our feelings. Hate and love describe our emotions towards someone or something. Hate and love are things and feelings and emotions we go through almost constantly. But when he says that a man will hold to one, hold means and has the sense of being devoted to. And so you can think, okay, hold to the one that he's holding on to one of these, but just as much as holding on to it, it's holding on to the man. You are devoted to it because it has your full attention. It has its grasp on you just as much as you have your grasp on it. So you're going to hold to one, devote yourself to it, and despise the other. And this word despise, it means to look down on. As if you are at a place that is higher than what you are looking at. That you are looking down on one because you are devoted and holding on to another. The thing with these descriptions are that they are actions. Jesus is describing actions here. And so Jesus tells us something very specific and very profound, that in serving two masters, either our emotions or our actions will clearly choose a side. That whether in our emotions of I love this one, I hate the other one, or in our actions of I'm devoting myself completely to this one, and that one's just not important. It's not as important. It, we look down on it. That either in our emotions or our actions, we will always choose one which means we are not completely and totally serving two. We don't. We never will. You cannot serve two masters because of these things. And then Jesus goes on at the end of this verse, reveals the masters that he is speaking of, and it takes it to a whole new level. I love that he saves it for the end, but he says all of that to say this, Look at the end. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon is often best described as money. Uh, and it also, and really, it refers to any possession that you have. So, yes, if you have money, you possess it. Uh, but also anything else that is in your grasp, anything else that is yours, your possession. And these are the two masters that Jesus sets up for us. And he says, you cannot serve both. You cannot serve the God who holds you and the things that you hold, is what Jesus is saying. And it's because either you will hate one and love the other, or you will dedicate yourself to one and look down on the other. We think through that. And Jesus sets up these two masters, but we think, okay, well, I must be serving God because I know I don't hate God. I don't hate God. I, I, I love God. And, and I don't look down on God. I, I, I am devoted to him. I am dedicated to him. I, I'm here in church this morning. I, I love God. I'm dedicated to God. So that can't be me. And that sounds like an easy statement to make in theory. But Jesus is about to make it practical for us. So I want you to keep reading Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Jesus says this. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. 
what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Jesus starts and says, therefore, and that means that everything he's about to say is pointing back to what he just said. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, don't care about your life. Don't worry. Don't be anxious about any aspect of anything that pertains to your life. That's easy. Come on. There's so many things that go into our life, go on in our lives that make us anxious. And Jesus just says, don't worry about any of it. Don't, don't be anxious about any of it. If he knew what I was going through, it'd be a different story. He wouldn't say that if he knew all the struggles I was going through. Don't worry about any part, any aspect of your life. That's what Jesus says. And Jesus actually gives examples of things not to worry about. And it actually drives home a deeper point. He says, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. And we could easily lump this together with what he says about the body, that your body and the raiment that you put on, what you put on your body. We can say, okay, your body needs food and water and clothes, and so it's just all about the body. But Jesus, again, is making a distinction between two things. He says, take no thought for your life, nor yet for your body. That these are two separate things that he is addressing. When this word for body is used, especially next to life, body is specifically referring to the physical aspect of who you are. And I think we get that. That's how we refer to our bodies. But life is used to describe your soul, your psyche, what makes you have life. And that makes the examples Jesus uses very helpful. Because look what he says at the end of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. He says this, Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Listen, food is important. It absolutely is. Talking from someone that absolutely loves food. I get it, it's important. But there are aspects about what makes you alive that food cannot touch. That, yes, eating food is helpful and necessary and it fills your stomach. But your life is more than that. That there is more about you than just the physical. And that's what he says here. That if you're having a rough day, sometimes... If I'm struggling through a day, I can go and eat some of my favorite food, get some Taco Bell comfort food, and it makes everything better. But most of the time, that doesn't work for when life is a struggle, when hard times come. Food doesn't fix that. In fact, sometimes you can't even eat because the struggle is so deep and the hurt is so bad. There are are things about food that are good, but it doesn't fix everything about life because it cannot touch the most important aspects of your soul, of who you are within. Clothes are important for your body. I'm glad we're all wearing clothes. It's important. But there is much more to your body than putting on clothes. When we have struggles with our body, if we break something or uh, there's an internal disease that is wrong with our body, we can't just say, oh, don't worry, I'll put clothes on and everything will be fine. It's ridiculous. And that's what Jesus is making the point. That clothes are good and important for your body, but there is more to your body than clothes. There is more to your life than food. And Jesus then gives illustrations about these two to help us understand the point he's trying to make. I want you to read along in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26. Jesus says, Behold the fowls of the air, 
For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? An illustration from a bird that has no control over how it gets its food. And Jesus even lists some of the ways that we can get our food, that we sow seed to grow crops, that we reap it in for harvest, that we gather it together in storehouses so we can have food when we need it. And he says the birds don't work this way. They can't. They just fly around and they get what they need for the day. They bring it back to the nest and they have what they need for the day and the next day they go out and they, and they get more. And day by day, it's not the same place. And they don't just go to a storehouse. They don't just go to Walmart and get everything they need. They, they don't rely on anything except the fact that they're going to go out and look for food. And they believe they're going to find it. God is the one that provides for the birds. And he says, are ye not much better than they? Now, when he says this, he's not, it's not giving us the idea of, look at you puny bird. I'm so much more intelligent and awesome more awesome than you. That's not what it's saying. This word better here has the idea that you are different in a way that excels. And there is something different about us in a way that excels above any other species. It's the life that is within us, the soul that is within us, and God proves that. You have a soul that God cares for. There is a life within you that God loves and adores so much that the God of all the universe humbled himself to become his own creation, to become a servant, a slave to his own creation, to live a life of perfection that we can't live, so he could die a death that we deserved. Why? If it wasn't for the birds. He loves the life that is within every single one of us. There's something different in a way that excels. And God is saying, I take care of the birds. I'm the one that loves you so much. I died for you. Are you not much better than they? Can I not provide food for you? I want you to keep reading in Matthew 6, 27. Jesus says, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And as I read through this the first time, it almost seems out of place. Because Jesus just gave an example of something he was already talking about. The life being more than the food. And he's about to give an example, and we're about to look at it, of the body and what you put on it. But right in the middle, he says this. What I've found, that in context, this verse is so powerful as we see the illustrations that Jesus uses to surround it. And so what we're going to do, I promise we're not skipping this verse. We're going to look at verse 28, and then we're going to come back to this because it is so powerful. But right now, let's go on to verse 28 as Jesus goes on to illustrate the example of the body. Jesus says this, And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? This flower, the lily, is given as another illustration and what he says is it doesn't work hard. It doesn't spin itself a certain way to look a certain way. It just grows where it's planted. It doesn't even say, I think that soil's a little better over there. I'm going to try to uh, unplant and pick up over here because I think I'll grow to look nicer if I'm in that soil over there. It doesn't. It just has no control over any of that. It's planted and it grows. And yet its beauty is compared to King Solomon. From the Old Testament. And this gives us an idea of the importance to the clothes. It talks about the glory that is arrayed in, and that shows the glory and honor 
towards the one that is wearing it. And we kind of feel the same about clothes today. It, it makes you look good, makes you feel good, even gives you a sense of comfort. You have clothes on it. It, it is important to us. Or we wouldn't spend so much money on it. It, it. it has an importance to us. We realize that. But the lily is beautiful and honored without working for it. it. Has no control over the process. And yet it's a beautiful flower. And God gets the credit. He's the only one that can. And it's just a flower. Shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. Jesus makes this an issue of faith. But can I tell you what has always been my struggle with this passage? These aren't things I worry about. These specific things are not things that I worry about. Jesus says, don't worry about your food. And I understand that this is a real struggle for some people. It is something that requires faith on a daily basis. But for most of us, the only worry is where we're going to eat, which type of food we're going to eat, what we're feeling today and what we're not feeling today. Not if we'll be able to find food to eat at all. It almost seems disconnected. Jesus says, don't be anxious about your clothes. But my only thought is which clothes I will choose to wear. Which sun's jersey I'm going to wear tonight before the big game. I, I, we, we, we don't necessarily look at this and say, oh man, I, I don't know if I'm going to have clothes for tonight, but now I'm going to trust God with it. But if we feel that way, As we listen, we can hear these illustrations that Jesus gives for us and say, okay, I'm not worrying about my food. Okay, I'm not worrying about my clothes. So I'm good, Jesus. Thanks for the pep talk. I feel really good about myself now because I'm not worried about those things. So clearly, I'm in the clear. I'm doing fine. But if that's the way we feel, it's because we're forgetting what Jesus is actually talking about here. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Everything after that, he said, therefore, this, everything I'm talking about is because you cannot serve God and your possessions. It's what gives you the confidence to not worry about where your next meal comes from. For me, it's the mobile banking app on my phone, and I can pull it up and say, oh, good, I have enough money to buy a beefy five-layer burrito, good. My confidence in that situation is that Taco Bell's food is cheap and my bank account has enough money in it. Most of the time for us, it's money. It's the possessions that we have worked for and have control over. I'm not worried about my clothes because I already know I'm going home to a closet full of them. Sure, we can sidestep this. Say, I, I thank God for my money. I know it comes from him, and that's true, and that is the right place to be at. But what Jesus is showing us right here is that the truth about who we serve is revealed in the things we know we have no control over. The truth about who we serve is revealed in the things we know we have no control over. And Jesus already pointed this out to us. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And that brings us back to verse 27. Look at it with me. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Jesus has been talking about the life within you and the body. He gives these illustrations, and sandwiched right in the middle is this question directly pointed at every single one of us. 
Normally we would think of stature as our, our physical body, and that's right. And in that case, this question already starts to reveal something to us. He says, can you add a cubit, and that's about a foot and a half. Can you add a foot and a half to your height by worrying? I was in middle school once, and every single girl and every single guy was way taller than me, and most dogs were taller than me, and I walked around thinking, if you could add a foot and a half, I've worried enough about it. Eventually, I grew. I'm thankful for it, but worrying didn't get me there. Of course, we can't worry our way into growing a foot and a half. That's absolutely ridiculous. Maybe into growing a few more gray hairs, but not growing a foot and a half. We can't worry ourselves into it. Can't. But what's interesting about this word stature that Jesus uses here is that in the Bible, it actually has another more prominent meaning. And it's used more often to describe this. Your maturity or your lifespan. So not the stature of your physical body, but the stature of your life, your lifespan. Can you add any length of time onto your lifespan? A lot of times we wish we could, but no matter how much we worry, we know the answer is of course not. In between, showing us examples of things that we could worry about, but we can control. Jesus perfectly describes the most basic aspect of how our life and body work, and he shows us, obviously, no matter how much we worry, we can't change it. We don't have control over it. He gives us these examples of the food that we shouldn't worry about, the clothes we shouldn't worry about, we're like, well, I, I got that. That's fine. I'm okay. And right in the middle, he says, what about this aspect of your life? What about this aspect of your body? No matter how much we worry, we can't change it. And yet, we worry. In fact, those are two of the biggest things we worry about the most, about our body, about our life. These are the things that it makes sense to worry about. When we get news about our body, and they say there's nothing we can do. What's left to do but worry? We know we don't have control. That's why we worry about it. Something happens to our body or something, news comes up that affects our view of our lifespan and suddenly... We're not in control of that like we are our food and our clothing. And suddenly, Jesus reveals who our master has been all along. You cannot serve God and mammon. And when Jesus gives examples of things we're already comfortable with, we're fine. But if you feel comfortable in those areas and you're worried to death about the things that are not in your control, then you know who your master is. The God who controls everything, who holds you, cannot be your focus if you're worried about everything that's outside of what you possess. He can't be. He can't be the one you serve. And so we're comfortable and we're confident with everything we have in our hands, but the moment we don't, the moment it slips out, the moment it's out of our reach, you say, I don't know what to do. And someone comes up to you and they try to be helpful and they say, God's got it. And you're like, yeah, I know people say that. And you know what we do? We dedicate ourselves to one master and we look down on the other. I'm more confident in the things that I can control, but now that I'm in a situation that I have no control over, I'm not as confident because what I was dedicated to, to everything, was everything that I had in my grasp. 
and we completely ignore the God that has everything in his grasp. It is when we are in situations where we are not in control that we recognize who our master is, even in the situations we feel like we can control. You can claim, I trust God for my possessions, but if you're freaking out about everything that's not in your control, then you weren't trusting God in the first place. Because he's just as much in control of your height and your lifespan as he is your food and your clothes. And if you're only comfortable about the food and clothes part and not the other things, then your master is what you can hold and not the God who holds you. What we think we need is revealed in our time of need. And normally I would say that I have no idea what you're going through, and it's still true. There are hundreds of lives in here right now, and you are all going through things that I could never even guess, maybe not even comprehend. But right now, the church that's gathering here today is in a very specific time of need. And I realize where we are right now. I'm not blind to it. We're searching for a lead pastor. And with that comes all types of worry, no matter how long you've been here. I have been here for about three years. Some of you have been here for decades. Some of you, this is your first time ever coming here. And no matter how long you've been here, a fact like that naturally grows worry. I want to come to church because I know I need God and I need his word. I need fed spiritually. And what if I'm not fed spiritually anymore? What if the culture changes? I love this place. I love the people here, but what if it doesn't stay the same? What if I don't feel comfortable here anymore? Questions that seem totally valid to me because they've crossed my mind. I get it. I'm here with you. But that anxiety has no place in the presence of Jesus. It doesn't. These very things are the exact things Jesus gives example of physically. And we say we're fine. But when we know we need these same things spiritually, why do we become anxious? Birds don't grow their own food, harvest it, or gather it together. They trust God to feed them day by day, moment by moment. God knows you need fed spiritually. But that is not the job of whoever stands on this stage. It's not. That is what God wants to provide for you personally. Because he's real. Because he is alive. He doesn't need any man to reveal himself to you because he's still around. He's always around. He's always real. He's always there. And he's always wanted to reveal himself to you personally. Not have to wait for some other guy to stand up and tell you about him. He wants you to know him for yourself. He is the one that can provide your spiritual nourishment. Because he's real. God will reveal himself to you. He's your master. He wants you to seek him. He wants you to trust him for that spiritual nourishment and spiritual food. Lilies don't worry about how they look. Try really hard to get that way. And this church didn't either. We haven't done that. We haven't tried really hard to have a great culture focused on Jesus. We didn't toil and spin our wheels trying to be the church that we are. Broken people loving each other and pointing each other to Jesus is something only God can do. Maranatha is clothed by God in his glory and his honor. We've never manufactured it for ourselves. We never have and we never will. It's God's job to clothe us in his glory, 
and to show the world who he is and who Jesus is when they see us. It's not even dependent on us except for the fact that we're willing to let him clothe us. The only way we can lose that is if we lose sight of the one that has always provided it for us. It's the only way we lose it. It was ever, never ours to put together. It was never ours to bring to this point. God has brought us to this point, and God has brought every single one of us to this point to continue to grow us to continue to help us, to continue to lead us as we follow him and him alone. God wants you to depend on him alone. I want you to read along in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31. Jesus says this, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Do you know what he's saying here? The people that don't know God know they have needs. They do. If you talk to anyone off the street, and you don't have to talk to them for long to find out that they're going through something, to find out they have a struggle, to find out they have a need, everyone does. And for those that don't know God, some of their needs they can take care of, and some of their needs they get anxious about. But when you know God, and you're actually serving him, it's different. Because look what he says, continuing in verse 32. He says, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The world hurts. The world has needs. The world has struggles. And they know there are struggles within that the food won't touch, the clothing won't cover. And they don't have the hope that we do. So why do we live as worried as them? We know the God that knows our needs. We know the God that cares for every aspect and minute detail of our lives. We say we serve him, and yet we worry as much as anyone else that's only serving what they can hold on to. And it shows us that that's exactly who we've been serving as well. Our Heavenly Father knows and cares and has the ability to provide everything we need far and beyond what we can provide for ourselves. And we would experience the fullness of it if we would seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness instead of our kingdom and instead of our righteousness. This church, the people that make it up cannot be about what we're building but what about God is building in us has to be it cannot be about how good we are it has to be about how good he is because it's not our righteousness it's not our works it's allowing his righteousness to consume us we can try all we want to say I love this church and we're going to work really hard to make sure that it keeps moving forward. But it will pale in comparison to the work that Jesus Christ wants to do here. We can say, okay, we're going to try to be righteous and live up to every standard and every rule that we possibly can. So people will look at us and say, wow, they must be close with God because they're righteous. But that's not how it works. Because we're all imperfect. And those of us that have convinced ourselves we're righteous enough will drive out everyone else that just wants Jesus and just wants healing and just wants his righteousness to pour over us. We can't try to manufacture it on our own. The righteousness is not ours that we're seeking for. It's his. And we seek him. And it changes everything. Take no thought. Take no thought for your life, for your body. And Jesus adds one more thing. 
to not be anxious about. And he says it in verse 34. Matthew 6, 34, Jesus says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Through this, I have come to realize that the only way I can be anxious about what the future holds is if I thought I had any possession of it in the first place. When we live our lives thinking that we possess something that's in a future we don't know, then when everything crumbles around us, so does our hold on what we thought the future was. But we never possessed it in the first place. It's God's. And he hasn't lost control. When he is the one that we realize possesses every aspect of who we are and understands and possesses every aspect of everything we go through, how can we fear? How can we worry? How can we be anxious unless we still feel like we've got to hold on to everything ourselves? It's so easy to get caught up in everything that could go wrong, everything that is wrong with everything and everyone else around us, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says sufficient to the moment you are in right now is the evil that is there. And he's not telling you to go look around for everyone else. He's telling you to look within your own body and your own soul. Because the hinge that the future fixes upon is whether you will serve God and follow him into it or if you're going to keep trying to serve what you can hold on to. And if that has been your view, it's evil. It is. And it's crushed me to know that I've been worried about a lot of things simply because I can't control them. I know the God that does. You know the God that is in control. And so even when you know you don't have it, take comfort. Because it's never been about what you possessed. It's never been about what you had a grasp on. It's always been about the fact that God has a grasp on you that will never let go. You have a father that looks at you and says you're worried about how you're going to be provided for. Maybe not physically, but maybe a whole lot spiritually. He says, do you not realize that I'm the one that put that hunger in you? That you would hunger after me and my word and the things of God? God says, I'm the one that put that in you. Am I going to leave you to starve? He says, I take care of the birds. And I see your needs spiritually. And he's so much more will take care of us where we are at in this moment individually, where we are at this morning as Maranatha Baptist Church. God, he's got a hold, even when we don't. The only reason we can worry, and it's hard because it's easy to worry, but the only reason we can is if we're focused and we're serving what we possess, what we have a hold on. And I need you to understand, and Jesus is trying to show us, you cannot serve what you possess and the God that possesses you. So who are you serving? It's the evil that needs taken care of in this moment for each and every one of us. I think back even the past few weeks, of every moment that I've worried, of every moment I've been anxious. And I know it was all about the fact that I wasn't in control. And right now I recognize and realize that my God still is. Your God still is. And what he wants to do in moments like these is not break us to our core, is not leave us here in our worry and anxiety, it's not why he has us go through our times of need. 
He has each of us where we are right in this moment. So we will recognize he must be the one we seek for everything. Or we're not seeking him at all. Who are you serving? Dear Lord, as we all bow our heads.